We are live. Boa tarde a todos. É, perdão pelo, pelo pequeno atraso, mas nós estamos aqui agora com a professora Suzane Dovi. É, a professora Suzane Dovi fez a sua, gradu, sua graduação no Dartmouth College, nos Estados Unidos, onde ela se especializou em políticas públicas e se graduou em 88, 1988, com altas honras. Em 1990, ela terminou o mestrado em Literatura e Ciência Política no Trinity College, durante o qual redigiu uma dissertação intitulada A Question of Errors, A Critique of the Straussian and Bloomian Interpretation of Plato's Republic. Em 1992, ela concluiu mais um mestrado em Ciência Política, dessa vez na Georgetown University, e em 99, ela obtém o seu doutorado em Política na Princeton University, durante o qual ela redige a tese Beyond Privilege, Evaluating the Legitimacy of Advocates. Desde 1999, a professora Suzane Dovi atua na Universidade do Arizona, onde ela entra como professora assistente em 99 e torna-se associada em 2009. De lá para cá, ela é autora, se torna autora de várias obras, é autora de um livro intitulado The Good Representative, publicado em 2001, 2008, desculpa, cuja leitura eu recomendo muito a todos, do verbete sobre representação política da Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, que eu também recomendo muito, e de diversas resenhas, artigos e capítulos de livros que foram publicados em algumas das melhores e mais respeitadas revistas internacionais. Atualmente, ela pertence também a diversas associações científicas internacionais, tais como a Political Science Association, Western Political Science Association, Association of Political Theory e American Society for Political and Legal Philosophy. Bom, sem mais demora, eu passo agora a palavra à professora. Professor, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. The floor is yours. <laughs> Daniel, thank you so much for um, the invitation. And also, I'm so sorry, I must have caused you so much worry because I was late. And um, it's just a crazy time, I think, right now. And so we sort of yeah. have to um, worry because I was late. Yeah. And um, can you see my time, I think, right now? And so we sort of have to um, Can you see it? Sorry. Yes, we can see okay, it. Okay, perfect, great. Okay, so um, the paper that I'm going to give you um, is really a worry about what's happening in our democracies these days. And um, one of the things that um, you see in the literature is this sort of normative story that democracy um, relies on um, representation, but representation is not only necessary, it's a desirable um, form. So we shouldn't think like in the, in the past we thought of um, representation as sort of the second best to participation. But we have this whole like normative literature about why representation is good for democracy. So for instance, we have um, Melissa Williams arguing that representation is valuable for democracy because it offers a form of representation, the agonistic um, literature stresses that it fosters contestation. Lisa Dish argues it's a form of participation. Um, we see representation as promoting accountability. And here, and these, um, these last two bits are really important for my argument, is Michael Sayward's re recent discussion of um, representation argues that what's valuable about representatives is that not only do they advance political claims, but they literally construct our political identities. And um, what you see in all this literature is sort of this, um, the nice side, the touchy-feely side of democracy and representation. But um, in given what's happening in the United States and the world, I also want to recognize that representatives construct obstacles to democratic governance, not simply advance democratic governance. And in particular, I want us to think about the roles that representatives play in democratic backsliding. And so well, what the normative story about good democratic representatives downplays is what I'm gonna call toxic representation. 
That is how representatives play an instrumental role in eroding democratic authority and legitimacy. Um, and so what I'm going to argue is that toxic represent representation can construct constituencies that oppose democratic norms and threat and threaten the fairness of democratic procedures for adjudicating conflict. Um, well, this slide you're going to see is um, misleading because one way that I think schadenfreude um, representation changes um, how we identify what are undemocratic forces is it, it doesn't deny that hatred, so creating a hating constituency can be toxic. But I think what's actually more um, central to schadenfreude representation is how pleasure and actually um, a lack of compassion can play a role in undemocratic or in democratic pack sliding. Okay, so um, <laughs> this is my, my um, in where I'm from, Arizona, there are lots of poisonous snakes. And so you have to be able to identify um, poisonous snakes from unpoisonous snakes. And one of the dangers of toxic representation is, is that it actually strongly resembles representative, a uh, normal representative processes. And so that's why um, I think what's valuable about what, or what I'm going to be trying to do in this paper is to sort of start being able to identify um, toxic forms of representation. And to do this, I'm going to focus on one, just one form, but I'm happy to talk about other forms of toxic representation and what I'm calling schadenfreude representation. And so here's the first definition. Um, schadenfreude representation occurs when a group gains pleasure and feels represented when a representative makes a different group worse off. So you're evaluating your representatives and you're feeling represented not by how your well-being raises or falls, but by simply a comparative position to um, another group, an outside group. Okay, so what I want to accomplish with this discussion is to be able to identify and call out toxic representation. And um, I want to also show that how groups feel represented, um, their symbolic representation, as well as their substantive representation, can actually undermine the institutional incentives that produce democratic legitimacy. And here, I just want to be upfront that. Um, I really think that a democracy is only as strong as what the preferences of the citizens um, are. And so it makes a difference. I'm not one of these um, people who argues that um, democracy it depends on whatever the citizens um, want. I actually think certain outcomes matter for um, democratic legitimacy. And I also think that the way um, groups feel about their representatives matter for the legitimacy of their, um, sorry, <laughs> matter for the legitimacy of democracies. Okay, so um, in this way, what I'm saying is that Hatred is not the only way we should identify and call out anti-democratic groups, okay? All right, so the pleasure and entertainment of citizens can also contribute to democratic backsliding. Okay, so there, my talk's gonna have three parts. I'm really gonna focus on the first and the third part and go super quick through the um, second part, but I'm going to talk about why, demo, why um, toxic rep representation matters. And I'm gonna, using uh, Nancy Bermeo's 
work on democratic backsliding. I'm going to talk about three roles that representatives play in democratic backsliding. Um, then I'm going to talk about sort of why we shouldn't be focused on hatred, um, but pay attention to the pleasure of citizens. And then the third way is I'm just going to spell out my understanding of um, schadenfreude representation and talk about how it can undermine democratic legitimacy. Okay, so Nancy Bermeo in the Journal of Democracy argues that we should stop using like a Cold War conception of um, de-democratization, right? So instead of envisioning military coups, which, or as the, the mechanism by which we lose our democracy, what she argues is we need to recognize what she calls democratic backsliding. So it's no longer, democratic backsliding is no longer blatantly in your face um, opposition to democratic norms and values, rather it disguises itself as normal politics, right? And so the first way that she thinks democratic, um, sorry, democratic box lying occurs is through promissory curse. And what happens here is actors argue for temporary, so representatives argue for temporary suspension of democracy in order to promote more or better um, democracy. So you frame the ouster of an elected government as a defense of democratic legality and make a public promise to hold elections and restore democracy as soon as possible. Um, and the, those promises never um, come about. So here um, I'm understanding um, one of the things you can say is if you watch Fox News, for instance, what one of the things that Trump is doing is he's saying that um, that voter fraud is a threat to democracy. And so not conceding the election is a way to promote democracy and to real to safeguard um, democratic legality. The second way of um, democratic backsliding, which is also a role for representatives, is the concentration of executive power in ways that undermine the mechanisms of accountability. Here we see that representatives change the rules that authorize and hold them accountable so that they weaken the available ac accountability mechanisms. So um, one of the things you can say is, for instance, um, you know, having an attorney general who is approved by the, um, the Senate, right, um, who's supposed to safeguard the Constitution, becomes um, a partisan ally of the president. So it occurs when elected executives weaken checks on executive power one by one, undertaking a series of institutional changes that hamper the power of opposition forces to challenge executive powers. Um, such changes are made by some sort of vote or legally decreed by a freely elected official, meaning that the change can be framed as having a democratic mandate. Um, and then the third mechanism is strategic manipulation. And this form of backsliding occurs when the boundaries and identities of constituencies in order to reinforce the electoral authority of those who currently hold power. Um, it's tilting the electoral play, playing field in favor of incumbents. This list of manipulative and corruptive um, practices can include gerrymandering, stopping the census, hampering media access, using government funds for incumbent campaigns, keeping oppositions off the ballot, hampering voter registration, packing electoral commissions, not voting, <laughs> not counting mail-in ballots, um, changing electoral rules to favor incumbents, harassing opponents. Now, what's interesting about all of these tactics that representatives can use to sort of encumber representatives is that they're both incremental and in many ways unremarkable. Um, just to, again, you can sort of 
um, promissory cues, executive aggrandizement, and strategic manipulation. So when you start thinking about these updated, you know, get over your Cold War selves, um, it requires you to recognize that the threat to democracy can come from those who are espousing democratic rhetoric. And that um, what you need to be thinking about is actually um, threats to the fairness of democratic procedures for adjudicating conflict. Okay, so um, one of the things to go back to the sour point is what I think is really interesting is how you can use democratic language to create a democratic political identity around um, the very partisan um, political behavior of democratic backsliding. So it's really interesting to me, um, for instance, that when you watch Fox News, they talk about the survival of our democracy and our freedoms as tied to supporting Trump, right? So you use, um, you know, you, you sort of accuse the other side of being undemocratic and as a way of advancing your undemocratic agenda. Um, okay, so here is just, I think, one of the most common ways for identifying what is undemocratic. And, and it's typically by what people hate. So um, there's a really wonderful um, Simone Chambers and Jeff Kopstein article on bad civil society, right? And talks about how economic inequalities produces bad civil societies. And you can sort of see that um, we tend to think about people who are unegalitarian as haters. Um, but what's interesting to, for me about, um, or, or what's inadequate about that way of understanding what threatens our democracy is that it allows for citizens to maintain feasible deniability because they don't experience themselves as haters. Right. Um, and that might strike some people as um, as mm, sort of, <laughs> I don't know, self-deceptive or at, were at best or um, naive at worst. Um, but one of the things I want to I want to say is that um, if you look at the interview at um interviewers of Trump supporters, and th this is mainly what I'm thinking my concept of schadenfreude through, um, Trump supporters will often say things like, oh, I don't take seriously what he says, or actually that's a reason for supporting him because he, um, he doesn't speak like normal politicians, and so he's authentic. And um, I want to argue that they're seeing him as an entertainer more than as a representative um, and of, of the United States. They see themselves as his audience. Okay. All right. So now I'm turning to Schadenfreude. So the third part, and hopefully he'll go fast. Um, I want to say I use a three-point definition. Um, citizens need to feel represented by a particular representatives because of how, not the, how the representative treats them, how they improve their well-being, but how they treat an outgroup, right? And particularly how they make the outgroup feel. So here I'm thinking about, um, you know, that you take a sort of, you know, you get titillated and gleeful when um, Trump says something offensive about women um, because it gets liberals and progressive citizens up in arms, right? So you get, you feel more represented when you make the other side upset. 
So instead of focusing on the positive gains of one's own group, um, the focus of schadenfreude representation is on how the representative debases, demeans, and brings down an outgroup. Schadenfreude representation recognizes that solidarity and loyalty to a representative can be built by attacking and harming others in the name of their constituents. So Schadenfreude has two essential characteristics. Um, the first is that it's a comparative construct. Citizen status and sense of well-being has to come at the price of others. It's you, you judge your position relative to the outgroup's position. And as a result, their sense of well-being requires um, being superior. I think in this way, um, sorry, um, President Trump's um, campaign slogan of making America great again is really about not necessarily improving the um, well-being of democratic citizens, but making it be superior and a more exclusive um, club to, um, to its citizens. They want to rule over, not rule with or rule by. <clears throat> other citizens. Now, a group feels more represented, not based on what the representative was pos positively, but on making another different group do worse. And I just want to say here that it's important to notice that there can be at least two different senses of worse. The first sense of worse can be sort of like you know, how's group A doing at time one and how is group A doing at time two? And if the, if the group is doing worse, I feel better. I feel represented, right? And so you can imagine like um, stopping the unemployment checks <laughs> um, um, as a way of, okay, now they're doing worse off. Now I feel better represented. But the second sense of doing worse is um, when you think of what's the well-being gap between group A and group B? What's the well-being gap between Republicans and Democrats? And here, what's interesting is that one way that you could make the gap grow is you can make everyone worse off. And in this way, if citizens are learn are judging not by whether their own well-being is increasing, but whether their well-being in relationship to the outgroup is increasing, I want to argue it creates institutional incentives to not aggregate a common good, but aggregate a, a common bad or a common worse off, right? We form majorities not on um, through the compromise, the giving and taking, which sort of improves everyone. But we make, we form um, policy preferences based on um, our own position relative to um, other people. Now, for some, this might seem like just another version of negative bipartisanship. And I understand negative bipartisanship as it's not that I like my candidate so much, it's that I really hate my the opposing candidate. So I don't, it's not that I like Trump so much, I hate Hillary. And um, I understand schadenfreude representation as sort of an unavoidable byproduct of negative partisanship. Um, but it's not about the hatred of one's opposition. It's actually about the enjoyment derived from harming and upsetting one's political opponents. It reflects how um, some people that both conservatives and liberals like enjoy hating each other. And I just want to give you one example of how messed up schadenfreude representation can be um, by saying that um, it, um, it can sort of blind you, the pleasure you gain from the entertainment, it can blind you to um, the Democratic black siding. So if you look on this quote, um, they I saw these interviews and 
what people, when they pressed people about the um, police pr presence and the military's presence against the Black Lives Matter movement, what they, what they, what they found was that people were fine with imposing um, suffering on a, a certain portion of the population as long as it hurts just their enemies and not their own group. So the second characteristic, so the first characteristic <laughs> is this um, comparative construct. And the second focuses on the delight and joy experienced by um, experienced by the represented. Um, so it's a kind of entertainment, a pleasure taken from representatives being deliberately, intentionally cruel um, to others. Um, and here, I, it's just really trying to take seriously why it seems like um, the Trump administration has gone out of its way to sort of increase the suffering of, of, of Americans and non-Americans. Um, and I want to say it's treated be, that way because it kind of, by treating um, politics as a form of entertainment, you don't you feel like you're watching a reality show, not reality. And as a result, it feels it's a way to, to diminish the suffering of other people. So um, what we see with um, when you treat a representative as an entertainer, um, you don't take their words seriously. And so I'm just mentioning, you know, a couple of strategies that um, sort of shot and for the representation uses. You often, you treat, you say, I was only joking when you make an undiplomatic or offensive remarks, making it like, oh, you know, the audience didn't it doesn't get my sense of humor. And so it's just a script. You shouldn't take my misstatement seriously. If you contradict yourself, it's not a problem. So you can blame people and mourn them at the same time. And you also, um, uh, you also bury and confuse audiences as a way to maintain feasible dying deniability. So by, by perceiving representation as a source of entertainment, constituents prioritizing viewing pleasure over effective accountability. By removing the sense that one is represented through the possession of shared policy preferences, shared experiences, or even shared political interests with the representatives, the incentives for compromise and constructing mutually beneficial deals with one's opponents are weakened. More importantly, it ignores how citizens, all citizens, possess shared interests and common ground. Um, and so the, um, so for instance, the protection of civil and political liberties like the sanctity of one's vote. And herein lies the danger. I'm almost done. <laughs> um, democratic government can form majorities not through making citizens better off, but by making them worse off. And an implicit claim of that um, argument is that democracy works better, ironically, sadly, when citizens care more about their own well-being than they do about other groups um, being inferior to them. I think that's that's it. I'm going to just stop right there. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Stop sharing. Bom, agora nós abrimos para as perguntas. É, eu estou vendo as perguntas para vocês aqui nos comentários e traduzo para a professora Suzane assim que eu as receber. Professor, I'm seeing their questions in the YouTube oh. channel. They will do them in Portuguese and I will translate them for you as soon as they arrive here. Great. Sorry. 
Let's wait a little more because they have there are problems. Um, they 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 are watching it with a little delay. Maybe it will take a little time. Okay, so I'll start then. Yeah, if you allow me a question, I've seen in your in your presentation uh, several echoes from uh, what you defend in your book. And the main idea of your book, if I'm not mistaken, is that there is such a thing as good democratic representation. And good democratic representation is about representing while fostering democratic values, norms, and etc. And one of the main things of uh, the value of democratic representation and, democ and democracy in general is the pluralism which we see, which we believe there is in society and with which we either have to reconcile us, if we use, you know, Rawls language, or which we could see as something positive, like, uh, uh, I don't know, like pluralists do, like Kimlicka does, and people who are arguing for, you know, arguing that that is desirable. And if I understand you cor correctly, what you're showing is that both toxic representation and Schadenfreude representation, they violate that, uh, that necessity. They go against the good, what, what would be good democratic representation. And I, I mean, at least to me, that rings very true in light of the current polarization that we find in several of uh, our modern democracies. You see in the US, we see in Brazil, uh, sometimes even more, I think, than you see there. So uh, the question I would, I would ask you is this, um, do you think this polarization, uh, the, way that, the, the way that it happened, uh, do you think there's a way back from it? Uh, do you see any way back from it? And another question that I would ask you is this. Uh, you say that uh, people don't see themselves as haters, that they don't believe they are so. But one of the things that I see in Brazil, and I don't know if you see that in the US, but here in Brazil, we see it very clearly, is that more and more elections are being decided by how much the final candidates, the, the main candidates, are rejected. And rejection is a very strong word as applied in this polls. It means here is the guy you wouldn't vote for no matter what. And uh, what we're seeing from political science is that this, this thing is getting people out of their homes to vote. They hate so much the other guy that they will actually go there. You know, that's, in, in, I don't know, in, in English we would say, this is what right. this is what is increasing turnout, actual hate. So, and, and my impression is, at least here in Brazil, people do see themselves as haters, and they they voluntarily say that about them. I hate so and so, and this is why I'm voting. I'm asking, don't you see that in the U.S. Um, also? So uh, definitely, I I I didn't mean to imply that. Um haters aren't undemocratic. <laughs> um, I think that um, for political extremists hate in the United States, hate is a very mobilizing um, way. It's, 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 it's actually the way to mobilize voters. Um, but I think at least in the United States, for you can't explain the, <laughs> the millions of people who voted for um, Trump as haters. And so here, what I want to actually, uh, what I think they see themselves is as victims, right? And so they perceive them like the, the whites perceive themselves as, you know, people are hating white people. And it's a concern about um, that as our demographics change, right, that they're going to be on the bottom. And so I, I want to say that um, I don't, I think it's really important to recognize um, the variation among Trump supporters, right, as we also recognize, and I would actually put it, so I want to put in fear and hate <laughs> into the, um, the, the, um, the rejection, the negative bipartisanship. But what I wanted to sort of stress in terms of like the Schadenfreude representation is that um, 
what representatives are doing is they're co-opting democratic language. We're the true saviors and they're the threats to democracy, right? And so, um, and, and, and so maybe it's, maybe like, you know, can you hate, that's why we become not political opponents, but enemies, right? And so when you start framing your, you know, the, the, how, you know, the other side is so corrupt, so morally bankrupt, so um, horror, like de demonic, at least that's the language we use, like they're monsters, right? And when we, when you're fighting monsters, you have to become a monster. That's Hannah Arendt's um, language, right? In order to, in order to defeat them. And so I feel like, um, it's the, how do you call it? It's, like, it's the um, arrogance of the people who feel self-righteous. É, Daniel, nós temos perguntas no chat. Eu também quero colocar uma uh -huh. pergunta. Uh, we, have, we have two questions in order. Uh, one from Professor Maíra Goulart, the other from Vera, Vera Chama. I'm hoping I'm saying the name correctly. So uh, what Maíra is asking, if I understand her correctly, is uh, do you think toxic representation always existed or do you think it's originated uh, in somewhere in time? And how can we fight it? And how do you feel about the idea, uh, which she takes to be present in a whole research agenda, that uses the concept of resentment to explain the genesis of right-wing populism? Right. Yeah, you know, I'm, <laughs> I think resentment has always um, existed. I think what's different about schadenfreude, um, and, and again, I, I'm, I apologize for being American-eccentric, but I'm thinking about it through the through Trump's administration, but I think it's, a, you see politics for its entertainment value, right? It's not simple, like there's this way in which people give, it's almost like, oh, it's a script. He's, he's just, be, he's doing his Trump thing, right? As opposed to treating what he's, taking what he says as telling you what he's doing. Right. And so um, this sort of like because it's treated as um, entertainment, it's it's it doesn't have the same weight as. Um, so I think did people get joy out of when other people lost the election? Yes. Did they feel resentment when other people won the election? Yes. Those emotions are have been here in humans forever. But what I think is particularly novel and innovative about schadenfreude representation is, and this is just my my sense about the um, the cynicism of Americans about what their representatives can do for them. Right? Is it's almost like they've given up that the government can make things better. Right. And so they're taken as sort of like a second place prize of, well, at least he's entertaining. Right. At least he makes me laugh and at least he pisses off the liberals. Right. And so that's I think that's different. Right. Like, sure, people voted, you know, you voted for Bush because you wanted to have a beer with him. Right. As opposed to Gore, who is sort of boring. Right. So we always turn to characteristics. But I think this view that I want or I'm going to I feel represented by how my representative makes me feel. Right. Sort of shows the importance that, you know, you can see that's partially tied to identity politics. But I want to argue it's because symbolic representation has in many ways replaced substantive representation which means I care more about how rep my representative makes me feel than I do for what he does on my behalf, for me. Okay, so another question, this one from Vera Shama. 
Would you say such phenomenon, you have very appropriately named toxic representation, is somewhat an effect of the flaws of the liberal democratic representation in providing a better life and citizenship to many constituents? Yeah, I mean, because, well, as I just said, I think, um, I think that both the Republicans and the Democrats, I mean, if you look at like Larry Bartel's work, you know, they, they, you know, what they do is they tend to represent the, the, the upper 25th percentile. They don't actually pay any attention to um, what the middle class, let alone what the working class um, thinks about. And so I think when so many promises and so many hopes have been um, destroyed. I, I, you know, I, there are lots of ways you can criticize the Obama administration, but one is, you know, it's real failure to respond to Ferguson and to police violence is one such oversight. So if you think that, you know, oh, once, if you think it doesn't matter who's in office, right? then you can sort of give yourself permission to be like, I'm not going to I'm not going to take their promises and campaign slogans seriously. I'm just going to go for the entertainment value. So yes, I think that what makes citizens give up on substantive representation is the very real disappointments with democratic government. Uh, Priscilla Cupelo, now one of our students in PPGLM, asks you a question that to, you know seems like the most important question maybe. How can we fight toxic representation? Can you say a little about different forms of resistance and um, political action? Oh, this is such an interesting... <laughs> so um, another... I, th I gave Daniel a choice of two papers. One was on misogyny and the other was... Because I'm what I'm really interested in is different forms of toxic um, representation. And one of the things that's really hard is that I really don't think there's a magic solution and bullet. Do you know what I mean? Um, personally, what I think is happening um, is that, um, and I see this, sorry, okay. So, so my first answer is I have no idea, but my second bullshit answer will be, I will give it a go for the sake of, um, for the sake of hope. <laughs> so one thing I would say is, I think it's really important to start locally and to form, um, to form alliances and talk with people. Like I cannot, um, when, when Trump got elected, my class almost got into a fist fight about taking a knee for the American flag, right? And, you know, my, my one, it's so funny, my one, one of my students who's a very activist, like what his parents got him for his birthday was a bulletproof vest so that he could go to protests, right? And I really think things have reached this point where we are so afraid of um, talking to each other, right? And and disagreeing. And so I actually, you know, I've been I I'm part of in my university after one of my um, Gabrielle Giffords was shot. We started this um, organization for civil discourse, right? And when you get people talking about values, they actually um, are more responsive. And so, and even things like, um, so these are like my sources of hope. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, where is his name? He's at Ohio State. Oh, Michael. Anyways, one of the things which they talked about was, ironically, online, um, when when representatives had online instead of town meetings, they were able to get more diversity and people were able to talk to each other more civilly. And I am not a like, I actually believe in like strong disagreements with citizens, but I think there's something going on where it really is in the outrage industry's best interests 
right? It keeps you scrolling through Facebook. It keeps you watching Fox News 24-7 because you kind of get addicted to the hatred and the fear um, that I think we need to sort of um, figure out how to sort of break, like, I, I can't ex I can't explain it. Like we're isol we're politically isolated from each other. I have a question. Okay. Oh, oh man. <laughs> oh, Professor Dovey, thank you so much for your lecture. Uh, we Brazilians could definitely relate to what you were talking about. And uh, my question is, would you say that uh, representative democracy should be understood more than just a form of government, but as a form of social life? And when I ask you that, I have in mind uh, the social conditions for a good and democratic representation. Uh, in, your, in your book, The Good Representative, you talk about virtues that citizens should look for representatives and from which we should judge representation. So in other words, my question is to demand these virtues from representatives, should we also have them as individuals? And should we also exercise them in other spheres of life, not just in the political sphere? Um, yes. <laughs> so my, um, the way I think about it, um, John Dreisick really influenced me and for my good representative book. And one of the things which he argues, right, is, and you can also see it in Laura Weldon has this really interesting empirical analysis about when does representation occur, right? And for, uh, for domestic violence um, literature. And what she found was that in order to have good representation, you need good citizens putting pressure on the bureaucracy and your elected officials, right? And so I, that's why I think I started off saying like, you know, democracy is only gonna be as good as the preferences of its citizens, right? And so to me, and I, you know, and it's especially true when in the pandemic, like I just feel like we need, it sounds so naive and innocent and I apologize, but, I think we need to be kinder, do you know what I mean? And allow um, pluralism, like that we don't all have to do things the same exact way, like what counts as a family and what counts as a good religion or what, like it just seems to me that why haven't we learned as like the reason you need democracy is because we disagree and we don't want to kill each other over those disagreements. And so we have to figure out some way and to live together. <laughs> right. And, you know, I feel like that recognition that look, um, you know, I, I, so I feel like there, something has to shift, right. In which, um, and I, you know, my, the way I describe my morals right now is that I'm just anti-asshole, right? I'm so sick of assholes gaining power. And I feel like we, we require like, like pushing up good people. You know what I mean? And like, are they perfect? Hell no. Do they, do I agree, disagree with them? Yes, of course. They're, I'm not, you know, but what I want is I want people, right, who attend to the vulnerable, who like want democracy, like in order for democracy to really work, you can't, I, I actually, I've been thinking about this all the time about how, like, you know, my whole thing is like, how can Amy Barrett live with herself? Shouldn't she resign as the Supreme Court? Like if she had a shred of integrity, right? Like you'd be like, my career is not as important as this political moment, right? And so like, I feel like what I see is our representatives putting their careers over their 
democratic commitments. And I, I just want to say that that's why I think it ties to a different, the article I wrote recently in the journal of politics about absences, you know, I actually think resignations, right, are, are probably one of the most important, like res resigning, like re recusing yourself when you have a conflict of interest, resigning when you think something is threatening your democracy, right? Those ways of making absence are how you democratically represent the people. So yes, I think that um, our values have put assholes above virtuous democratic citizens. Thank you. We have uh, one more question from the chat. Eric Vega uh, makes a point about polyarchy. And he says, in polyarchy, Dow argues people evaluate their social standing compared to people in similar social economic groups. But you argue people compare themselves with an outgroup. And he wonders, uh, are these two visions contradictory? Um, you know, it's funny. Um, I would argue that, um, so I haven't thought about this. So Eric, it's a great question. And thank you for the question. <laughs> um, but I, would, I just want to say two things. So one is, you know, what I care about is power. And what we know about when people compare themselves to in-groups is that in-groups also have power dynamics, right? And so when you compare yourself to your in-group and you're trying to, I feel like what often happens is you police the identity of the group by making those, you making your inside group. So if you're a gay Republican, you're outside my group. Right, you're not a real Republican. And so I actually think maybe it's a different moment of comparison where you, when you define who are your people, right, you want to not have gays have too much power. And you want to keep, um, I have this article, which I like, I looked at um, the literature on, um, Sorry, I looked at the literature on Trump's brand, right? And he argued, um, when, how do you sell a luxury good? Is you make it exclusive. So, for instance, if you're if you're no one's buying BMW cars anymore, how you make it more desirable is you raise the price, not lower it, right? And so you you literally promote superiority by promoting exclusivity. And I feel like what we're doing is we're making our group more exclusive club in order to promote our sense of superiority and in order to foster that we're on the right side, right? So instead of saying like, oh, look, or a rainbow coalition and look how, look at, our democraticness because we're pluralist, right? It's saying, look, it's an in form of entrenchment of the in-group. And Dahl wrote a long time ago, and he didn't talk about race. Well, we have no more questions so far, so I'm going to pose a question for you which is something about, about which me and Hayani have discussed uh, recently, which is uh, most of what you say, I think all of what you say, it rings true to everybody that is here. And uh, we are people who value these things. We value pluralism and we value democracy. And uh, until a short time ago, I think we were used to inhabiting a political sphere where everybody paid at least lip service to these values. And I don't know, maybe we got comfortable. Maybe we thought, you know, these people believe in these two and we don't have to argue for it anymore. You know, we don't have to. It, it's, it's beside the point to be singing the praises of pluralism and democracy. But I think that we're seeing right now is that these things need defending. 
and and not only in the sense that we got to say we are for them i mean people need the society needs for us to explain to them why is it that they should value them too and i mean one of the things that i learned from your book i think is that this is harder than it might seem at first uh, it's harder to show to a rich asshole why is it that he should value pluralism and democracy it is according to some conceptions some very influent conceptions of representation he shouldn't <laughs> it's not it's it, it may be as simple as that you know and and this in in another sense i think that this should put us in god against what we are we are expecting you know maybe we will have to fight for these things maybe they are not uh, any more values that we can take for granted do you think that's the case or do you think that we still have it's it's still i don't know coherence it's, it's still plausible to hope that these values are in the core of our society they are largely shared you know it's funny um i feel like what the empirical political scientists will say is that public opinion is not stable right and so there's not a stable pro-democracy or anti-democracy and that they're really you know pushed around by the whims of their representatives and in that case you know when i take michael soward's argument that like what our representatives do is they kind of shape our public opinion right and so i do think um given how manipulated the public can be that um, we can swing one way or another. But I did want to just add that um, the, my compassion inside <laughs> wants to also add, and it's something that I've just noticed again, um, it's something I call a compassion deficit, <laughs> that I really believe that, at least in the case of Americans, that they are so stressed out about their economic well-being and about getting a job and support, like, you know, whatever, about consumerism. But it's about, it's a real sense that they could be <laughs> homeless, right? That um, they have no mental space for um, taking on the suffering of anyone else. And so I feel like, um, maybe I'm gonna just blame capitalism, but like, I, I just feel like we're, we're, we're working our way, our lives away so much that we're kind of losing our humanity. And, you know, so what we're doing is, I feel like, you know, um, here Hannah Rent is really helpful because I think what we do is we don't recognize sort of the everyday forms of evil we participate in and sustain because we're told just don't think about it just focus on school just focus on your job and family just focus on like don't think too much and don't feel compassion and so somehow you know, and this, I, for me, it's also tied to like the lack of art and music and reading and like the ways and I always think of like reading is like growing the heart, <laughs> you know, that like we need to like really be consciously um, like growing hearts. That's what I think. Do we have any more questions? We have one more question. Oh, yes, Jean. Um, Jean asks. Yeah. Such an interesting question. Um, do you think toxic representation do you is a think ontological insecurity? And how this concept can help to understand the phenomenon? It's so funny. I'm just going to say what I, 
Um, I do think we're like in a bit of an existential crisis right now about, I mean, I think the pandemic brought it on sort of like it makes everything feel meaningless, right? And, um, I, it, and, and so when you're, when you, when you feel like your life is not meaningful, right? I think it's very hard to like do uh, again, like I think of, you know, how, um, uh, Hannah Arendt calls imagination the gift of understanding, right? And that this gift of understanding allows you to understand, like, allows you to try to find your place, like, so you're not a foreigner or stranger in the world, right? And I, I actually feel like, um, I, I think more and more people are lonely and they're also, like, cranky and unsatisfied with their lives. So I, as a result, you know, um, that I, I do think that it's like, that's why we're craving laughing, <laughs> you know, like we, I, there's something going on in which all, you know, we want, we just want to escape the global warming, the, the I, I, you know, the racism. I feel like there are these huge problems that just make us feel powerless. And so, yeah, I do think that the ontological insecurity feeds the desire for escapism in our politics. One more question, Stu, from Ana Claudia Lopes. She thanks you for your presentation and asks you to expand a bit uh, on the last point when you said that democracies work better when people care about their own well-being. Well, I was just thinking about, um, you know, at least in theory, the way democratic legitimacy works is you're supposed to aggregate preferences to form a majority. So you know a majority of the people get their way and that a, a, lot, a majority can sort of find their policy preferences in the actions of the government. And that's why I was sort of, I, I sort of think of democratic representation as like this continuous process in which you're constantly trying to solve problems and, and you're introducing new problems. And it's, in, in that sense, it's a little agonistic. <laughs> um, but that said, um, when citizens don't care about their policy preferences, when you think it doesn't matter whether Trump vetoes or not, right, where you don't care about what he truthfully believes because you don't think um, representatives get anything done, then it gives, it prevents the kind of institutional incentives that encourage people to compromise. So why can the Senate refuse to do, like, you know, hear Obama's Supreme Court case, right? It's because they don't think they can gain anything from compromising and have it holding the, um, the hearing, right? And so when you care more about making the other side you know, undoing all their legislation. It uh, doesn't matter whether you have a replacement legislation, right? It just is getting rid of Obama's legacy. Then I feel, my sense is you can create a majority in which everybody is worse off, right? You don't care if we have health care for everybody. You don't care if you have health care. Right? You care that those poor people won't have health care. Right? And that kind of intentional cruelty, where you're actually not willing to sacrifice for the good, but you're willing to sacrifice for the bad, right? Is, um, I feel like, what we're facing in the United States. I don't know if I answered. 
<laughs> well, I think this is it, unless we have any more questions. I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> So um, what would your example of Shakurta representation be in Brazil? I think we have so many. That's a hard question. <laughs> that, that, is a, that is a hard question. Um, you see people, I mean, um, back when, uh, when, we, when our last government was getting impeached, um, you saw a lot of people uh, being happy for what was happening. Um, you know, when Dilma was impeached and you talk to them and you and you ask them, I mean, do you think it's going to get better? Because, you know, her vice president will take control of the country and everything you're accusing her of. I mean, do you think he's innocent? He'll be innocent. Of all, and people didn't. They were mad. They were very mad. They They wanted people to suffer. They wanted people to pay. They wanted that. And uh, I'm not sure that today you wouldn't find that on the other side, you know, like this, uh, I don't know, this desire for blood, no matter where it leads, you know, revenge, resentment. I, I think that we have plenty of that, unfortunate, you know, unfortunately we have plenty of that. Anna Claudia said something else too. Um, oh, it was a it was a complementation of the first question. Can I just say one thing, Daniel? Because I actually find it really helpful. <laughs> um, so I remember thinking, like, how could South Africa ever have a peaceful transition and not go for blood? Do you know what I mean? And and like. I remember thinking it was impossible to have a peaceful transition, right? And so like part of me feels like, you know, I, I do think that what you said, like I there's something going on in our world where the intensity, and I actually, this is tied to my discussion of misogyny, the intensity of the anger towards women, right? Is really like, it is in particular um, triggering people for rage, not just hatred, rage, right? And um, I think that um, for me, <laughs> um, that I don't know how to say this, but something's going on where I really don't think it's, it's tied to not having hope that things can get better, right? That you feel sort of, I like it, it's Anna's um, point about uh, um, existential, um, I'm sorry, ontological insecurity, do you know what I mean? That if you don't think that um, you can gain progress through the normal political channels, I think that is when you go for blood, right? So something, so I, I feel like, you know what, I, I do think that, I, it was so funny, I, um, I really loved Cori um, Bush, who's like the first black um, federal representative in Missouri. She's, she, this is such a, a hokey person, but I'm a hokey person. And um, they said that um, I love the constituents. And I would actually really love to see what democratic representation looks like when representatives love the people, you know, love them, like want to take care of them, not some bullshit rhetoric, but actually care about their well-being. Yeah, I would love to see that too. Um, I I don't know. I think my father and my grandmother they experienced that in relation to some of their representatives. I saw that in them. 
I saw a lot of disillusion to West Ham passes, but I saw that in them. But about South Africa, they had Mandela. And that is something that, you know, I don't know, philosophers tend, and I mean, my, my undergraduate course in, is in history and both philosophers and, uh, and history, I mean, we, we tend to, to just, you know, say, oh yeah, yeah, of course there was this leader, but what is important is the movement, is how the people felt felt, you know, and the more and more I look, the more, more I look to, to our his, recent history, the more I believe that it's not so simple. I, I don't know what would have happened to South Africa without Mandela. I honestly don't. Without a guy like him, with a history like he had, a voice like he had, you know, the power to actually direct people and to instill them, instill in them some hope, because, you know, if he has hope, you know, if he, this guy is being hopeful and it's some, someone you believe so much, you know, that we can be hopeful too. And we see some people believing that about our current president, which is funny in a sense, but they do. And just as you saw, as I saw, some people believing that about Lula too. You know, even in the worst times, you saw that, you know, you saw poor people believing very, very, you know, badly and dearly in them and this is something we need i think you know uh, we need representatives who you know who act like they love the people and who love the people and we need to, the people to feel loved and to retribute and that's i think it's another problem which that takes time to build you know <laughs> that takes a long time to build i hope we can build it i i, I, I really do uh, coming back to the questions, Anna Claudia tried to uh, clear up. Uh, her, her question was actually about the claim that democracy works better when people care about their, their own well-being. And she wonders whether that is a claim uh, only from inside your diagnosis of toxic representation, or if you consider this focus on particular well-being, or uh, particular interests perhaps, uh, good for all democracies, at large, you know, and how do you create that space, you know, the, the space where people are back to, you know, caring about their common interests, the other particular interests that they share. I don't know how you think about this, this thing. Um, so I do think, Anna, that the, um, the selfish point, I just thought it was an interesting result of um, <clears throat> I, uh, coming from my diagnosis of schadenfreude. Um, in general, I'm more of a pro common good kind of person. <laughs> so um, I think that um, what's interesting, you know, is we talk about, um, so, so some people argue that when the vote became a secret ballot, that that's when people started voting their pocketbooks. Like when you had to vote in public, you had to go up to the bar and shake the hand of the representative that you wanted to elect. You couldn't, you couldn't like, you had to stand up for what you were doing, right? And so it was kind of using publicity to make sure people um, vote the way they say they were. And you could sort of even understand the, the, the polls, like the failure of the polls as, people not wanting to say who they're going to vote for, right? Um, so I actually think that, um, you know, I, we can understand um, the vote or the way people vote as very narrow self-interest, although you get all these, like, really interesting cases, right, like what happened in Kansas where people are using identity politics to surplant, surplant, so, and this goes to my question, or my my claim that symbolic representation has overcome substantive representation, understood as economic interests in some mild way. Um, but one of the things I would I would argue is, um, you know, I'm not such a binary person. Is I think that democratic citizens need to recognize how the well-being of other democratic citizens is in their best interest right and so you have to sort of recognize like i i sort of joke um 
you know, there's a, a TV show which shows um, stars do their racial background, right? And, you know, and sort of like do their DNA, right? And I was like, you know, white people don't think people of color are family members, right? And what would that mean? Like, you know, I feel like I get this with my students of like, oh, of course you should put your family first, right? And I'm like, but we don't, like, unlike other countries, we don't think, like, we don't think of ourselves as like, like my community is my family, right? And so I actually think that's why I said about the growing hearts, right? Like we have to become more compassionate um, with our fellow citizens. So I believe in a com common good more generally. I think we've reached the end. Any more questions? No more questions in the chat. Making you all wait. I'm so sorry about being late. No problem. Very glad you came. We're all very glad you came. I want to thank you very much for accepting our invitation. We hope you come back. And I want to thank everybody uh, who watched the, the presentation on the way to the end. Uh, Hayani reminded me uh, to remind you all, and now I'll switch back to Portuguese, queria lembrar a todos que estão aqui que nós vamos ter mais sessões do workshop eh, de filosofia e teoria política, e que na próxima sessão nós temos a apresentação da professora Desirê, que é a professora de direito na UFPR. Nós temos o cartaz, que vamos partilhar agora na tela. Professora Enes Salgado, da UFPR, Aí. o título da comunicação é Entre Mitos e Crises, o que há de representação na representação política. Vai ser no dia 27, portanto, daqui a duas semanas, às duas horas, nesse mesmo horário. Muito obrigado a todos, espero que vocês tenham gostado. É, até a próxima. Até a próxima.